have uh, uh, three students who've uh, uh, decided to join us here and comment on the election. I see Professor Thomas is bringing some, something to uh, steady his nerves <laughs> while he talks about this debate. Uh, Daniel Ludlam, uh, Tyler Finn, and Fiona Bass, uh, I'm sorry, Bear, Bear, Bear. Bear. have agreed have agreed to, to join us tonight, as well as uh, Professor Ta and Professor Thomas from the Government Department, and also Professor Helland from the Econ Department. So I, I wanted to, st we, uh, we ended the debate talking about voting, and I want to direct the first question to our, our students. I mean, this is a, likely the first presidential election you voted in, uh, and what a hell of a time to uh, be introduced to a presidential election cycle. Uh, there's an article today's, in today's Wall Street Journal talking about how interest is down right now amongst millennials, generally speaking. Um, it's pretty clear that millennials are not strongly interested in either candidate, um, that Hillary, when compared to Bernie Sanders and under 35 voters, uh, you know, millennials continue to prefer Bernie Sanders, even at this late stage in the election. So my, my question for you, you know, the, the indicator's all very poor. I, I just saw in the Washington Post the other day, too, uh, another sort of chilling fact that 40% uh, of Americans say that they no longer have faith in American democracy. I mean, this is, this is a really stunning election to be introduced to the American political process. So I'd like to hear from one or all of you what you've learned from this election cycle so far about American politics. All right. Well, um, I think this is a pretty disappointing election to be introduced to, right? Um, in that you have uh, a candidate on one end who, in my opinion, is pretty reprehensible. And are we on camera? <laughs> um, and a candidate on the other side um, who is competent but uninspiring, right? Um, and so, I mean, I think what this election teaches us is that um, it's a long path to the presidency, right, uh, oftentimes, and um, that there's, you know, a lot of steps you have to take and that there are a lot of special interests involved, and I think, you know, the big question that I have coming out of this election is how millennials will respond in the future. Um, to me, that's one of the most important questions, um, and, you know, I, I'm a Californian, and I think back uh, on kind of like California history, and I think about Proposition uh, 187 here, and I wonder, you know, even if you have two candidates who are generally disliked, to what extent people associate the policies or just the opinions of the two candidates with the parties? Um, and I really wonder how the two parties are going to shape up after this election and how millennials will respond in the coming decades, whether or not this will really align uh, our generation with a particular party. Fiona or Daniel? Yeah. Um, so I agree with Tyler in a lot of respects about what he said. Um, but I think something that I find particularly important about, like, I don't know. Is this, can, um, so what to learn about democracy, or at least what I've noticed from this election, is kind of how easy it can break down, especially in rhetoric. And I've been actually like really appalled at how accepting I think people seem to be of allowing rhetoric about that. Like even in this like in this past debate, talking about not accepting the outcome, talking about jailing a political opponent once elected, things like that. I think as millennials, we need to like actually grapple with the weight of that and what that means and not just brush it off as like, oh, it's this political circus, that's why we shouldn't care. I think that's why we should care. Um, and so that's something that I've definitely thought about during this election cycle. Um, one other thing about kind of like this, I mean, Tyler characterizing Hillary Clinton as uninspiring, and I've heard plenty of millennials say that, that's also kind of troubling to me, I think, as a young woman that, Yes, she has made plenty of mistakes, but she's also had an incredibly long career, and the fact that we're hopefully about to elect our first female president is huge to me, um, and definitely means a lot about like what I hope for my career, and I think plenty of young women that I know interested in politics feel similarly. Um, so at least for me, like that's one kind of hopeful thing that I'm trying to see in this election. Right, to close this, um, question out. I think it's very indicative that for Gary Johnson, his greatest strength lies with millennials. Who's that? that? 
Ouch. deep breaths. Um, <laughs> so, but to, to that point, I think for a lot of people that even those of us who were old enough to vote uh, between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, I think that this election will remain in our memories for far too long because of, one, because of social media, and two, because of how gratuitous and how uh, obscene the statements have gotten in this election. I think what's particularly indicative of change within the parties, though, is that for the Democratic Party, they pulled out all the stops for Hillary Clinton, but for the Republican Party, they did basically everything within their reach to not have Donald Trump be their nominee. I mean, even when Mitch McConnell, who dislikes Ted Cruz with every fiber of his essence, is willing to throw his support behind that candidate, like that's indicative of how strongly they didn't want Donald Trump. So I think for both candidates going forward, and for, for both parties going forward, more importantly, the takeaway from this election is to say, you know, what do we want going forward? Uh, do we want to embrace this alt-right for the Republicans? Do we want to embrace this establishment, you know, uh, had her hand in too many cookie jars for the Democrats? Do we want to embrace, you know, what kind of candidate, what kind of party do we want to be? Because I think for both candidates, we've seen um, kind of a, a, a rock bottom in the minds of many American voters, particularly the millennials, and maybe, ideally, this is a time where a third party comes out, fingers crossed. Uh, maybe this is a time where both parties, I don't know, fire everyone in their leadership, probably not. Uh, this is a time, hopefully, where we see significant change in the parties, and I think millennials are the key bellwether on that one. Can I, can I add one thing? Very briefly. Okay. I have to wonder if character matter, matters at all, right? I mean, like, that's something that I sort of held as a principle for a long time, was that you know, there's like a baseline level of character that elected officials have to hold. And uh, a takeaway from this election is, I, I don't think this is hyperbolic. Like, I, I don't actually know if someone who is, you know, potentially like an attempted murderer cannot be elected to high office, right? Like, it, it, like to what extent if someone repents or doesn't repent, are the American people willing to look beyond that in order to... I don't know, see a new America in the future, right? Like, what sort of personal flaws, lack of virtue are they willing to put aside? I thought this debate uh, actually did touch on a few issues, which was surprising and pleasing to a certain degree. Um, one of the things that's happened this year that seems to, to be a, a new innovation of our, our journalists is the idea of the fact check. We get this all the time, and, and the 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 truthiness of the responses that uh, are given by either candidate. Professor Ta, I wanted to ask a, a broad and general question because there's a lot of discussion about foreign affairs tonight, about what's happening in the Middle East with ISIS, about Russia, their role in the campaign perhaps. Um, from what you heard tonight, can you give us a bit of a fact check on both candidates to say what you saw as being true or untrue in what they were talking about and how you see it? Um, does that work? Yeah. So uh, probably the f fact that was repeated most that was absolutely wrong is that Hillary Clinton made the decision to take American forces out of Iraq because, in fact, that was done under a status of forces agreement with the Bush administration prior to Obama coming in. And so the um, criticism that Obama and Hillary Clinton are responsible for the creation of ISIS because we pulled our troops out of Iraq is wrong on two counts. The first one being that it wasn't them who chose to pull our troops out of Iraq. And on the second count, they are not responsible for the creation of ISIS. That was created in the vacuum in Iraq when um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was allowed to form. They were forced out by Shia militia and Sunni militia and found their way into Syria, which was in the process of collapsing, and it had absolutely nothing to do with policies of this administration. It preceded the policies of this administration. So that was repeated again and again, and is just absolutely wrong. Um, the statement that Aleppo has fallen, also wrong. As you are probably all aware, it's about 50% um, uh, destroyed, but there is a significant population still living there, which is one of the reasons that it's so important that we consider what the options might be in order to respond to the humanitarian crisis that's occurring in, in that country. Um, the fact that Mosul um, is a, a decision, a bad decision of Hillary Clinton is also wrong. Um, that it's a bad decision even of the Obama administration is wrong. That's a, an effort that's being led by the Iraqis and by the Kurds. 
um, with some assistance from American Special Operations Forces who are there to train and advise. So all of those bits of fact, just points of fact, were wrong and repeated several times. Um, with respect to the Russians and cyber um, attacks and their uh, use of um, WikiLeaks to release false information, I don't know any more than the fact that American intelligence organizations have verified that that's in fact the case. Um, and so the claim again that this, it could be anyone, it could be the Chinese, it could be, it, it's, it, according to US intelligence, which is pretty good, um, the likelihood is, is that it was in fact the Russians. And today, um, Ukraine uh, actually caught and um, uh, is about to prosecute a Russian for hacking um, American uh, websites and American information. So uh, that seems to indicate that it has in fact been the Russians all along. So. Very clarifying, thank you. Um, other issues that were brought up, many issues relating to the economy. So Professor Helland, uh, I had a question in particular about free trade. I think this is a, a, an unusual pivot for, for really both parties and both candidates in the sense that the GOP in modern times has always been a proponent of free trade and yet we have Donald Trump being very much an enemy of free trade. We have Hillary Clinton who used to support the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and who made private statements that she's very much in favor of free trade, now opposing TPP and being generally very pessimistic about the notion of free trade under her administra administration. So how has it come to pass that both major party candidates oppose free trade? So, so let, me, um, let me start with a bit of a fact check that feeds into your question. Um, the first thing to note, that NAFTA came up a lot. There's something fairly odd about that since NAFTA predates most of the people in this room. Uh, you know, this is a very old trade deal. It was made with Mexico uh, in order basically to get the Mexican government to lower its tariff fares. It basically gave them a fig leaf. Our tariff fares were already quite low. So not surprisingly, it did very little in the United States and had a very, very large effect in Mexico. It was kind of designed to be that way. So I think the first thing is to attribute sort of all of the problems of the Rust Belt to NAFTA is to miss the fact that actually what NAFTA did was basically uh, bring the Mexican government, or bring the Mexican economy into the sort of the world economy in a big way. So I think the first thing to say is that attributing this to NAFTA, I'm gonna come back to TPP in a second, is, is a bit odd. I think the second thing to sort of point out, and I, it struck me, and you could say this over and over in the economy that Trump doesn't know what he's talking about, but perhaps that's a mild understatement. It's yeah, it's not just the economy. But here's the issue that, that you kept hearing about manufacturing jobs and conflating that with economic growth. Actually, manufacturing output is at an all-time high, uh, both as a, a total GDP and even as a percentage. We manufacture a lot of things in this country, we just don't actually do it with people anymore. It's very much what happened in agriculture back at the very uh, beginning of the 20th century. We had something like you know, 70 or 80% of the population employed in agriculture. Uh, we went down to a very, very tiny percentage. We didn't starve. Uh, so productivity has sort of fundamentally changed. We actually compete a lot with other countries uh, in, this, in manufacturing. You notice he kept sort of conflating with bringing back factory jobs with growth in GDP. In fact, it would be exactly the opposite, right? That in fact, if you began to manufacture things sort of with less efficient, more labor intensive means, you would actually have a reduction. One last point on this, uh, and that is, there's an upper limit to how fast advanced industrial economies can grow. Uh, it's about, you know, sort of two to 3%. And so the last one on this is to say, you know, when he talks about five, 6% growth and compares this to India, India is a very poor country. China is a very poor country. They have a lot of growth because a lot of capital is coming in. Now, to your point about Clinton, and so I guess I'll set Trump on one side and say, doesn't know what he's talking about. Then I'll sort of set over to, to Clinton and say, I really like the Clinton of WikiLeaks a lot. <laughs> I, I, I want to elect that person, and I'm sort of hoping that's the, the presidential candidate. I feel like, you know, when she talks to sort of bankers, she says a lot of things that make sense. The thing you have to understand, Voters are rationally ignorant, as political scientists would say about the economy. They have things they believe. You could try to educate them. Al Gore did that uh, in the NAFTA debate. That tends to end badly in presidential campaigns. So what presidential candidates do is they tell you what you want to hear. We'll negotiate better trade deals. We'll do this. We'll do that. So I suspect, fingers crossed, that that's what Clinton is up to, that she's talking about TPP actually has us do almost nothing. It's mostly a fig leaf for Japan to lower its tariff barriers on agriculture. It basically, the hook was that we wouldn't include the Chinese, and therefore this would be somewhat of a security arrangement, but it's about Japanese growth. So 
in answer to your question, I'm extremely hopeful that Clinton is following all of the other presidents that have told the American people what they wanted to hear on uh, economic issues and not done it. And my favorite example is Barack Obama, who promised to renegotiate NAFTA. Didn't happen. Not at all. OK. Um, last question for the panel will be for Professor Thomas. Um, Republicans have made a case about the next nomination to the Supreme Court that seems to be, for many Republicans, a, a primary motivation for electing Donald Trump president. Um, they see it as being the most important and impactful decision uh, for American politics. And I, I wanted to ask you just how impactful will the next nomination to the court be in terms of the course of American politics? Are Republicans correct to, to put aside many concerns about Donald Trump and focus all of their energies on the idea of who will be the next justice of the Supreme Court? Uh, well, I would, I mean, the, the next justice will have a, certainly have an influence on the court. I mean, it was interesting to hear Trump take it as this is the direction America is going to go, which actually I want to make a small point about in terms of the change in conservative thinking generally there. But I mean, there's no question that the next Supreme Court justice is, is an important part. But I was, I don't want to kind of veer off into a bigger question here. Uh, I I'd was disappointed that. in the debate generally when, the, I mean, it opened with a serious constitutional issue and constitutional question. I was disappointed with both candidates in so far as they really were narrowly speaking about the Supreme Court, as if the Supreme Court is the whole of American constitutionalism. And it, the, there's no doubt the Supreme Court plays an important and vital role in the American constitutional order, but it's hardly the whole of the American constitutional scheme. And it's, uh, so it's disappointing to think that they're focusing on that alone. And this is, a, this is an election year where those issues could have been front and center uh, in interesting ways. And interestingly, they weren't. And I would, I mean, I feel a little bit like this is piling on uh, Trump, but I'm going to do it anyway. And one small point would be that it would be, it would actually be nice to have a serious presidential debate because there are issues, I think, that uh, both constitutional and political generally that could have come out of tonight's debate and the moderator actually pressed on, but the truth is that Donald Trump sometimes doesn't have a clue how to press or what's important or repeats uh, major talking points. That's the small point. The big point, and I wanna make a big point in some sense because it's of, of interest, I think, in this debate generally, but it's been uh, of interest in the Claremont community in particular if people are paying attention to the news. And I find the conservative justification of Trump on constitutional grounds extraordinarily myopic. First of all, I mean, it focuses solely on the Supreme Court as if that is the whole of American constitutionalism. The irony is that conservatives for decades have been insisting that you cannot reduce the Constitution to the court. That, in fact, the, the constitutional order as a whole is much broader than the court. Not only does it include the other branches of government, but it includes the citizenry as a whole. And yet they've embraced a candidate whose ignorance of the constitutional scheme is stunning on no account, who has, uh, in essence, disregarded uh, the whole notion of judicial independence in the first place, has brought into question uh, an understanding of constitutional free speech as vital to a political and democratic order has threatened with, again, no knowledge at all of executive power to appoint counsel, which the president doesn't just get to do, right, an independent counsel, to investigate a political opponent, right, and criticize her in the middle of election, threatening her with jail, go before Republican rallies, where we say that we're defending the Constitution and they chant cheerfully, jail her, jail her, jail her. Right? Worse, he seems willing to bring down democratic institutions and the legitimacy of democratic government, right? the very foundations of the constitutional order, right? because he might lose. I mean, we have never seen a candidate quite like that. And I know that's a little over the top on my part in terms of pushing the constitutional question there, but to have conservatives, conservatives at this institution, say that Donald Trump is the savior of the constitutional order because it is so corrupt, I find just mind-boggling. And I, I, find it in, I find it 
harmful in essence because I think it seriously undermines the constitutional scheme, but it also raises the question, so what's so wrong with the current constitutional order? I mean, there are lots of issues, but so let's talk about those issues, but how do you attach your wagon to a candidate who seems to be not only stunningly ignorant of those, but in real terms, maybe the greatest threat to the republic uh, that's out there right now? Well, <laughs> I'd almost like to end on that note, but I noted that, the, yeah, go feel free to applaud, but uh, I want to give at least one audience member a chance to ask this panel a question. We have enough time to do just that. So does anyone have a burning question that they'd like to address to this panel about the debate tonight? Who's the lucky member? Oh, I see a hand. So oh, um, I'm clearly not an American, so I'll ask the panel of Americans what went wrong that we are here today. Wow. Uh, could you say that? I, I didn't quite catch that. What went wrong? When? When? Oh, what brought us to this point? Ah, very quickly, uh, would anyone like to address that? Um, uh, speaking on behalf of all Americans. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, th the list sort of is, is legion, but all right, I'll, I'll take one shot. This is by no means a comprehensive list. I think one of the, the problems that's kind of lurking under this whole election is that we, we have a lot of policies. I'll just pick on trade because it was the one I was thinking about that our net benefit people. But I don't think we've paid a lot of attention as a country to how those benefits are distributed and how the costs are distributed. And I think what we're witnessing is that the, you know, a large number of candidates, you know, sort of in the Republican primary, that, that the impact of China into the WTO hit a very particular region. But if I had to make a broader statement, I think one of the issues for the United States that it really has to think about is how, when a policy is on net beneficial, but has very concentrated cost on a group of people, how do we deal with that? Because I think what we're seeing is that a large chunk of the electorate you know, that, that did not benefit from these policies is treating them as if, from their point of view, they were bad. And even if on net it's beneficial, they don't feel like they have been, in some sense, compensated or helped. So I think if I had to make a really broad statement you know, I would say the thing I hope we do as Americans, I mean, I hope we re-examine the primary system, I hope we think about the constitutional order, but I hope more generally we start to think about what it means when there are winners and losers to some of these net beneficial policies because we're living in an age with tremendous change and there are gonna be people who are hurt by them and how we think about our obligations to our fellow citizens and what that means because I think if that's not the case, we're gonna see a lot more of this going forward. Well, I think we're going to have to stop there. It is exactly 8 o'clock. I want to respect everyone's time. I want to please join me in thanking the panel for their insightful comments and thank all of you for your interest in this election and for coming tonight.